first place I want you to look is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. All right? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We've been going through what I've called the core values of the church. They're really, truly the core values of Christ. There are seven principles that lay the foundation that really define who we are as believers. They ought to define who we are as believers. We've been going the last few weeks through the principle of success, which I define as um, knowing and obeying God's Word is the key to all true success in His eyes. So, I'm excited to start another one today. You say, why do you have a picture of Noah's Ark and a flood? Well, because the flood is the world and the ark is Christ embodied in His church. We are to be an ark for those that are really facing eternal judgment and lostness. And are we being an ark as His church? So there's the four or five that we've done so far. Today's is pretty exciting. And that's why we're looking at Acts 1.8. Completing the Great Commission will require the mobilization of every devoted disciple. What is that a picture of? Anybody know? In, in western Minnesota or north of South Dakota, eastern Montana, that's, that's my country, where I come from. That's a wheat field. Gold and beautiful in the sun, ready to be harvested. Jesus said, look in the fields. They're ready to be harvested. But the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. How the Great Commission, fulfilling the Great Commission, will require the mobilization of every single devoted disciple. What does that mean? I was just thinking of somebody this morning getting ready for church. I was thinking how God likes to use ordinary people to do extraordinary things. That's his mode. There's a lady that I, she's with the Lord now. But for many years, she was just a beacon, a bedrock in the modern church. And she influenced a ton of people. She didn't set out to do that. She was a single gal. Lived with her family in Amsterdam. Helped her father run a watch shop. She didn't have a lot of aspirations necessarily for her life or knew where that would take her. But she loved the Lord. She loved her family. She loved people. And in their time of life, obviously, World War II broke out. And that really, Holland was one of the first nations to be really trampled and devastated by the effects of Nazism and National Germany at that time. And so they only did what they felt right as believers to do. They saw particularly Jewish people, God's people. They believed that Jews were still the apple of God's eye, and special people. I believe that too. I hope you pray for the peace of Jerusalem every day. They just did what they were able to do in that moment. We're going to hide some people locally so they won't be found. We have a house. We can do that. She had a cousin named Peter who was in charge of an underground movement that moved people running for their lives from place to place and keep them hidden. So, so he approached them and said, can you hide one person? They prayed about it, thought about it. Yeah, I guess we can, we can host one person, keep them in our house, just like having company. So they came up with a plan, got the plan inspected, the hidden room, the procedure for what do you do when the, when the SS comes and knocks on the door looking, timed it, how fast can we move, etc., etc. Well, that one person grew into how many eventually in their little tiny house. I've been to her watch shop. I've been to their house. It's tiny. I'm amazed by our standards here in America today that they had room not only just for themselves, but all those people living with them. They were simply faithful Christ-loving people who in the moment that they were called decided to do something. And of course they all were captured and taken to a concentration camp where God allowed them to be tested and dragged through unimaginable things that you and I cannot even probably begin to conceive of. But that is where she learned the depth of the grace and the love of God. And she came out of that horrible experience by miraculous intervention, by the way. She was never supposed to be released. But her name and her records got mixed up with somebody else's, and she walked out free and surprised. And from that moment on, she went on to impact people and share the testimonies of the living grace of God through ordinary people and extraordinary measures. Why do I share that with you? I believe that God wants to do extraordinary things with ordinary people in this room. He has to. Why? So that the power may be not coming from us, 
but might be clearly seen to be from God. I think we have we tend to have a view of the heroes of the Bible, hero, a view of the heroes of the faith that somehow they were special people, high in a, in a different stratosphere above us that we could never attain to. That they're they're special for the generation. In some cases, in some ways, that's true, isn't it? But I would contend with you that they saw themselves as completely normal people with no expectation or knowledge of where God would lead them. But they were available, and they were obedient, and they were willing. I've known a few of those people myself in my lifetime. I'm often reminded, dear, of your Aunt Joyce, who is now with the Lord too, who, you know, she went to Wheaton years and years ago with a sibling, and that was what the family wanted to do. She wanted to go to the mission field. So, as a single lady, she went to Ecuador for 40 years by herself and translated scripture and taught Sunday school lessons. And you can imagine, as a woman living by herself in a culture, uh, that was very frowned upon for a lot of different reasons. Mm -hmm. Every time I knew her, she could barely walk, and she always walked with a limp and a, and a stoop because one night she was dragged out of her house by an angry mob of men who beat her with sticks half to death because she was a woman alone. A number of things like that. She was one of the radio operators who called in the, uh, the martyrdoms of Jim Elliot and Nate Saint. They knew each other. And I listened to this lady's stories, you know, sitting in her living room, or as it was, her, her little room at the nursing home. And I hear these names, and I hear these stories, and I hear these people, and I think, sacred ground, you know? That's, it's Aunt Joyce. What does God, what extraordinary thing does God want to do to you, if you will obey this call to be equipped for the Great Commission. Let's take a look at some verses here real quickly, okay? Uh, could somebody please look at Matthew 28, 20 and 21? They're familiar, but we should review the Great Commission, okay? If that's what we're called to, all of us. What does that say real quickly today? And then we'll look up Acts 1, 8 as well. And then we'll refer to some of these other passages, John 15 and 1 Corinthians 12. Does anybody want to try to quote it? I'll let you read it today, okay? Any? I'm, I'm willing to Margie, read. want to read Matthew 28, 20? Yeah, I'll And 21? Yeah. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, right? And, no. No, Matthew 28? Let me turn the page. No. <laughs> I got it. I got it otherwise. Okay. Teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. All right, would you read verse 19 as well? You bet. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. Right, you got to get the whole thing in there, beginning to end. I appreciate that so much. Who is, who is speaking these words? Jesus. As he ascends into heaven. Jesus. And, he is, and he is speaking to whom? Disciples. Right, so I hear the argument from time to time. Those were his words for those disciples. They don't apply to everybody. Have you ever heard that? Not very often, hopefully, because I'll tell you that's false. There's no room for spectators in Jesus' kingdom. You know what a spectator is? Somebody who sits in the bleacher and says, you go play the game, I'll stand here and watch, I'll cheer for you. I don't think there's any bench either, by the way. I think we're all players out in the field of life that Christ has called us to. There is no room and no time for spectators or bystanders or people who sit and watch in the kingdom of Christ. We're all called with this great commission to go into all the world and teach everything that Jesus has said particularly the good news of His grace. Are all of you recipients? I hope and pray. I know what we all are. But do you realize that you are a recipient of Jesus' grace and mercy and love and provision and constant faithfulness today? We've heard some good testimonies, but we are. The grace of God. It's, it's undeserved. It's unmerited. It's unearned. I know that, but it's also so much more than that. It's the living power of God through the Holy Spirit that just showers on your life and overwhelms you. As David says, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the presence of God forever. He was overwhelmed with joy at the grace of God in his life. 
And part of the product of the grace of God is that that overwhelming, that cup overflowing, what, did, what does that cup overflow to? It should overflow to those around me. Each person that I meet, we should be a taste of God's grace in our life. We can't keep that for ourselves. Acts 1.8. Let's get a little bit different flavor of the same action, the same story. I'll turn there too, okay? Acts 1.8. It's Jesus speaking again. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. I have that verse underlined up here because we'll refer back to it in a moment. We're going to dissect it a little bit. I'm looking forward to it. John 15, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. What are, what are those about? Uh, can I have someone please look up 1 Corinthians 12, 12? Any volunteers? Richard? He beat you just by hair, Glenn. I'm going to refer to John 15. We talked about John 15 a little bit in Sunday school today because in John 15, it's all about abiding in Christ, dwelling in Christ, being grown into Christ as our, what? Our vine. We're the branches. And a, and a result of being united with Christ, being in Christ, His design, His desire, is that we bring forth fruit. And that our fruit should remain, and that whatever we ask in Jesus' name, He will hear us and He will do it for us. Jesus talks about fruit over and over and over again in John 15. What is He talking about? What is that fruit that He has actually designed and intended and created and saved us all for to produce? What does He want produced in our lives that that fruit is? Any, any thoughts? Number one, that's Christ-likeness. That's unity and closeness and intimacy with Jesus, that we know Him well, that we're walking close with Him, that we love Him, and our love daily grows together in a relationship that's real with Him. But it's also Christ-likeness, that we take on His character, take on His attributes. There's a third aspect of fruitfulness. What literally is fruit on a plant, on a tree? Every tree produces fruit after its kind, whether it's a pear, a plum, an apple. I grew up in, uh, with an orchard. I loved having that orchard and those trees we could take care of. But every, every plant we had, it produced fruit every year, and inside that fruit were seeds. The potential for that fruit, that tree, to reproduce itself and bring more fruit and more fruit and so replenish itself over and over and over. That's what God designed inside every seed. And so it is with you and I, Christians. We are commanded by Christ by nature of our relationship with Him. Because we're Christians, because we know Him, because we've been saved, we have to reproduce ourselves. Every one of you, I, we need to be reproducing ourselves in someone else. And so the cycle continues. That's the fruit He's talking about. Are we giving the Gospel, investing the Gospel, and Christ's likeness in the lives of other people who desperately need it? That might mean, as I've been learning, that we have to lose sleep or get uncomfortable, or be somewhere we don't want to be. Maybe even get our hands dirty or smell funny, or be rejected. Yeah, I mean, sharing the gospel, was Jesus ever rejected? And he says around John 15, the same place, if they treated me, the teacher, the master, the same way, how can we expect any different? But that's my point with these passages, is that to produce fruit, we have to be reproducing ourselves in other people. That is what we are called to do as Christians. Are you reproducing yourself? A Christian in somebody else's life? Are you planting the gospel seed? 1 Corinthians 12, 12. Who had that? Richard. How many verses? Just 12. I think verse 12. And then keep reading. Boy. Until I tell you stop. <laughs> For as the, the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized in, into one body, whether we be Jew, Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, or have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, it is therefore not of the body, and if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore uh, not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, were, uh, okay. Keep going. No, you're doing good. I just, I, the, the visual of a whole body being an eye is striking. Sorry. You're good. If the, uh, the whole body were an eye, 
where were uh, where were the hearing? If the pool were hearing, uh, where were the spelling? But the uh, now uh, hath God set the members, every one, every one of them in the body, as it or as it hath pleased Him. And if they were all one member, where uh, were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need to, uh, of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. All right, that's perfect. I wanted you to get to the last part. That was a lot there, Malfo, good job. The eye can't say the hand, I don't need you, you're not like me, we're different. The, the head and the hands can't say the feet, I don't need you. And so we are one body here sitting in this room, yet many members. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to see that. Every single one of you, remember the parable of talents from Matthew 25? Everybody was given a different talent, a different amount, a different gift, a different ability, a different investment to make. The point of uh, Corinthians 12, 12 there, 1 Corinthians, is that each of you are different. You're not the same, and yet you are called to knit together to one body to make that body function as a whole and live and be healthy and serve its purpose. I believe that every church, no matter how big or small, has everything it needs in that body that Christ has given it to do its mission. You can't, a church can't look around and say, well, we don't have such and such or AY, ABC, so we can't do that ministry. You know, we, 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 can't, uh, we can't worship that way or we can't reach these people because we're just missing these too many parts. It might mean that somebody who has that gift in that body doesn't want to say, I'll do it. Maybe they don't even know that they have that gift. They need to be cultivated. They need to be encouraged. They need to be drawn out. But every church body has the pieces of the parts that's needed to do Christ's mission for them. And that means here. He's able to do that extraordinary work through ordinary people. You all have different gifts, but they're all incredibly necessary for the kingdom of God. Not everybody's up here. Thank goodness. Some days I probably shouldn't be up here. If everybody was a mouth... How would that work? Poorly. Not everybody's a hand. Not everybody's a foot. Not everybody's an eye. Not everybody's a nose to sniff out. Something stinks in Denmark. Let's find it. Let's fix it. We need all those parts and pieces and people together. What's your gift today? What part are you? There's no part that's not needed. You are needed. Obey the Spirit of Christ in you. Let's look at Acts 1.8, just for a couple minutes, because I like breaking it down. You will receive power. Let's see. This is plugged in. That's plugged in. That's plugged in. Obviously, the power grid is on today. We have lights, we have heat. Praise the Lord for all these things. That's just simply the image here in Acts 1.8. You will get plugged in. When the Holy Spirit dwells in you, you will be plugged into the source. You will be alive. You will have energy. You will have something to feed and move you and, and direct you. That unplugged from the Spirit, you're dead. You're dead. So that's the picture here of Acts 1 8. We have, we're plugged into the power of God. But not only that, who are they called to reach? Who are they called to go to in Acts 1 8? Do you see the progression? Jerusalem, that's where they were. That's their hometown. They're all standing somewhere by Jerusalem that day. Judea is the country in which Jerusalem is found. Mm -hmm. Samaria is the country next door. And from there, to the ends of the earth. And that's exactly what they did. Every church, every church age, every group of people has their Jerusalem, their Judea, their Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth that you can reach. And as we comment today in Sunday School, somebody said the world is getting smaller and smaller. And we're able to have an impact on the other side of the world, even from right here in this kind of place. And we do, by the way. There's a little insert inside your bulletins today that I just wanted to make mention of briefly. And that is, it's a reminder that in the fall, we make a special extra push to support missions in the, in the, in the, in the Missionary Alliance. And that is an opportunity for you to look and pray about. And if you have questions about the Great Commission Fund or the giving push in the fall, I'm happy to talk more about that. But that's just a visual reminder to you, between you and God, Say, am I going to commit to making Samaria and the ends of the earth happen 
right where I am, you can make a difference with your prayers and your giving. And there's even other opportunities that the Alliance offers, short-term mission trips, connections with people, hosting. There's all kinds of different things we can talk about. But now is a good time to remember that. Different ways that we can support and reach our Jerusalem and Judea. What's your Jerusalem? Who are your neighbors? What's your gifting? So coupled with your location and the gifts that God has given you, what is your mission for the gospel? How are you going to fulfill the Great Commission? And I'm so glad that it is a co-mission. You notice that, right? He didn't just send us on a mission. He said, lo, I'm with you always. It's a co-mission with who? Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. The Lord is with you in that mission. And if he wasn't, it would be a waste of time and a disaster. But it's a co-mission. You are not alone ever in obeying the call of the gospel. Here's an interesting word. What does the word witness me, and you will be witnesses unto me. Anybody know? That's some insight into that word. What's a witness? They go tell what they've seen. That's somebody who bears testimony, someone who says, this is what I've seen, this is what I've heard, I'm an eyewitness, this is, this is what I know. And their word has great impact. There's a little bit more to it in this case, though. That's right, correct. Absolutely correct. In this sense, does anybody know what the Greek word for witness is? Uh, you were not Greek scholars, neither am I, but the word is martyros. Anybody recognize that root? Martyr. You are going to be martyrs for me. Wow. You know, in the early days of the Alliance, when they began sending missionaries out to strange places like China, that was one of the first places to send missionaries to. The early missionaries, their husband, wife, team, and families, they would pack all their belongings and ship them out. You know what they would ship them in? Their own coffin that they pre-ordered and brought with them to the mission mm -hmm. field? Because that was likely what was going to happen when they went. And they went knowing that already. With that mentality, just accepting that. And as a visual reminder to them of where their trust was, that they were going to go and they were going to be witnesses to Christ in the literal sense of the word. Wow. Well, that might change your look of the word witness a little bit. Maybe God will not call you to uh, sacrifice your life literally and physically, but there are always sacrifices to be made. Discomforts to be experienced. Denials to ourselves that have to be made in order to be effective. Aren't we glad Jesus did that for us? He called us to carry a cross. If anyone would come after me, if anyone would follow me, let him take up his cross and deny himself daily. Okay, A life of denial, carrying a cross. Because whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever will lose his life for my sake and witnessing and the Great Commission and the Gospels will save it. Oh. You mean only what's done, only when life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last? That's one of my favorite poems by C.T. Studd, who was a professional, very famous athlete and a professional sports person in his day. He was literally the, he was basically the, the, the version of this time of Who's your favorite basketball player? Who's your favorite baseball player? Who's your favorite football player? Okay, That was him. And he gave that all up and walked away and went to be a missionary in Africa. With the same mentality that those other missionaries I told you about. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And that's the thing that's going to save my life. In the end, he knew it. We're going to have to cut things short today, but that's okay. Because of communion time, here's what I want you to consider the common aspect. God chooses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. I gave you the example of Corey Ten Boom earlier. I didn't ask her name. I don't even think I shared her name. Corey Ten Boom, little old lady who went and changed the world, teaching people, explaining to people. You know, one day she was in a cathedral in Germany telling about her life experiences, and one of the German prison guards who was in the camp when she was in prison there, would beat her and abuse her and torture her every single day, came up and said, I've given my life to Christ. And now I'm trying to make good and make right by apologizing. He didn't recognize her. He was nothing. She was nothing to him at the time. She recognized him right off from seeing him in her dreams every night still. He asked her forgiveness, just as a prisoner of war, and him as a former Nazi. I don't know you, but would you forgive me? Unknown to him, she knew him well. And she was able in that moment 
to say, yes, I forgive you. And it was true. Just an ordinary person who learned the extraordinary grace of God because of the circumstances she was put in. The Bible's full of totally ordinary people. I like the example of Moses. Who was Moses? He was a, he was a herdsman. Okay? He was a shepherd in the wilderness who didn't like people, didn't know God, didn't want anything to do with people. He ran and hid. He just wanted to be left alone by the world. That's Moses. Any of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they weren't great guys. They were, they were wanderers, nomads in the desert that God revealed himself to and did tremendous things to them. I love the Bible because they paint the picture as it really is. They show these Bible characters not as heroes and heroines, but people of sin, people of life-changing failures and mistakes, yet God redeemed them through all those things. That's how you know the, one of the reasons you know the Bible is true. It shows it as it all really is. How about the disciples? Peter, James, and John, who were they? Commercial fishermen. Anybody here know any commercial fishermen? They're pretty crusty, aren't they? they got a pretty hard life. That was Peter, James, and John, the guys who went and turned the world upside down. The ones who spoke with boldness before the Sanhedrin and says they marveled at them and took knowledge of them that they'd been with Jesus. They were unlearned and ignorant men who shouldn't be doing this, shouldn't be speaking this, shouldn't be this way, but they were. Who was Ruth? She was a little widow lady from a foreign nation, a pagan nation who God chose to bless and revive and really bring the life, the, the line of King David and ultimately the Messiah through her. How about Rahab? Same with her. Who was she? She was a prostitute from Jericho who decided to have faith in God and side with his people in a very critical time. These were nobodies. These were actually what some people would consider the trash of the earth. Mm -hmm. But God doesn't see people that way. Nor does he see his mission that way. The list goes on and on. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, Scripture says, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. He delights to use the small, the weak, the, the broken, the looked down upon, so He can proclaim His glory through them. And the world can say, wow, there is a God, and His name is Jesus. It's wonderful. So what's our excuse? What can I say? Do I dare get into it or not? Oh, this is the hard point. This is the hard time right now. One of my favorite stories in the Bible, and I love having like a miniature sermon series on these major characters, whether it's David or Abraham or Moses. Oh, we got to save it for next week. That is terrible. That's so terrible. I'm so excited. Can we just stay for another, can we stay till 1 o'clock and just do this? I won't do that to you. Um, read Exodus 3. Read Exodus 1, 2, and 3 as your assignment to go home this week and think about how God likes to use ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. And I want you to rethink of how you see Moses. Okay? Mm -hmm. Read Hebrews 11, too, the chapter of the heroes of faith. How God took people and He did extraordinary things through them because of their faith. And we'll come back and we're going to talk about it. And I think, like it did for me, it's going to change your life. Mm -hmm. When you understand who Moses was and yet God, what God did with him. He did not even know who God was when he met God. And yet, after time of getting to know God, he became known throughout all history as the friend of God, who talked to God face to face and says, nobody ever knew God like Moses did. There was never a man like Moses ever again in the, in the history of the world. Hmm. We're talking about a guy who was a shepherd, who didn't want anything to do with people, was running away and hiding, and did not even know who God was when God met him. What happened there? Mm -hmm. That's a process that he wants to bring each of you through. And so this, the shepherd who hated people and wanted to run away became a leader of one of the greatest stories in the history of mankind that everybody knows and loves. God doing ordinary, extraordinary things through very ordinary people. Mm -hmm. Lord, as we begin to oh, just barely scratch the surface today, I just pray that you would enliven to us, take, help us to take to heart the need, the true need, in order for the Great Commission to be accomplished, in order for your mission on earth to be successful, you want to use all of us. There are no bystanders in your kingdom. There are no seat warmers. There are no spectators. We must all be active contributors to the kingdom of Christ in this earth. So please, Lord, convict us. Give us opportunity, whether it's to serve the church, 
here in a visible location. I know there's many people here today who have ministries to their neighbors and other places wherever you plant them that we will never know about, but you know and you see. Lord, give them courage and give them success to plant seeds of the gospel everywhere we go. Because time is too short to be wasted on worldly things over ourselves. Thank you for somehow choosing mere mortal human beings that you have saved and redeemed. Thank you for redeeming us to do this tremendous eternal work. We're just empty vessels, Lord, filled with treasure and goodness. Help me, Lord, not to keep it to myself, but pour it out. And keep filling me over and over again to keep pouring it out. Your goodness, your treasure, to those that are hungry and starving and desperately need it. Teach us, Lord, what our gifts are. If we're a hand, if we're a foot, if we're a nose, if we're an eye, an ear. And plug them in so that everyone will be used. And inspire these people to walk with you. Through your word, we're just ordinary people. But all since the beginning of time, you have used very ordinary, lowly people to do incredible things. And you know no limitations. So we trust you and we surrender ourselves freshly to you. Be with us now as we take communion. As we commune with you privately and quietly in our hearts where only you can see, please forgive us and heal us and cleanse us from any impurity, anything that separates us from you. And may our communion, our fellowship, be sweet and tender and close and growing with you and therefore also with one another. We ask that Satan be bound and rebuked. I've heard that prayed a few times today. It seems like uh, from the first day I moved here, this church has had a target on it for some reason for Satan's attacks. And I just pray, Lord, that that would be a sign that you are doing good things, but also that you would be unsuccessful. That you would protect your people and give them reprieve and give them strong armor to use. Give them victory. We know, Lord Jesus, you already won the victory. So may we have victorious, bright, shiny faces and lives that come from being united with you. As we have success and as you answer our prayers and as we have the victory, We'll be sure to give you glory as we do now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.